Did they tell you like back then is William lah, right? Mm. Go and date first lah. You you know? Yeah. In those you days, don't know no. yet. In those days, people were still very cuckoo and gundo. I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had many girlfriends. I mean, oh, what's it like to be friends with Pope Francis? This is your daily catch up. So we have a very special person with us today. He may or may not be our oldest guest on the show yet. Yikes. Mm. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> hey, let's not offend him in the first two minutes. I mean, wisest. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what's special about him. He's special because he's the first ever cardinal that Singapore has ever had. And he is Eminence William Go. Hello, welcome to welcome the show. Welcome to the show. So for those who are wondering, what is a cardinal? How would you explain it? A cardinal is one that has been appointed by the Holy Father, which is the Pope, which is the Pope, to work together with him and to support him in his ministry. Cardinal comes from the word cardio heart. Oh. So, so that is the reason why uh, the, the Pope appoints cardinal that are closest to him um, to help him and to advise him on the way in which we should uh, govern the universal church. So and how many times have you met the Pope before? Four. Different Popes. Like, are your you friends? Know. Oh, different Popes. Oh, well. not oh. really friends because <laughs> I, I don't work in the curia. What is the, the curia? The curia is something like uh, what in Singapore, in every government, they have ministries. Right. So instead we call ministries, we call them curia. Mm. Uh, so there are different curia attending to different matters in the universal church. Aren't there like three, four hundred cardinals? I think, I like think there could plus. be about um, two hundred or two hundred over cardinals. Right. But out of the two hundred over, uh, only hundred and twenty over can vote for the new pope. I see. Yeah, yeah. because the, all cardinals, in order for them to vote, they must be eighty years and below. Then oh. if you are 80 years and above, you are still a cardinal, you will still be invited for consultation, but um, you have no the eligibility to vote. Which means that there are 100 plus cardinals that are above 80. Eh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I would think yeah. so. Uh. Yeah, 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 of course. Wait, wait, allow, of me course. To, allow me to explain why this is a very big moment for me mm. and my, my mother did not believe this is happening. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. So then Hello, I are both Catholic. Uh, mm. Let me know if I get it wrong because it's mm. a super lame understanding, mm. okay? So there is a priest. Mm. We all know what the priest is, right? Mm. And the priest uh, higher up is a bishop. So in bigger countries where there are multiple big districts and regions, there might be multiple mm. bishops, right? So if there's multiple bishops, mm. then after that, they all report to the archbishop. Mm. So far, correct? Yeah, no? and it's a very simple way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. below priest, <laughs> uh, after between priest and bishop also got also got more levels, right? Got yeah. monsignor and stuff like that. Like, huh? <laughs> so after Archbishop, which is the highest Singapore has ever had, but Singapore don't have a bishop, so we, because mm. we are just a small place, right? We have our first cardinal. After like 55 years or 57 years of Singapore, I have no idea how old Singapore is. How old Singapore is? 23 minus 65, that's like 8 at 58. Mm. 58 years of Singapore. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, minus. So, so basically, you have been um, invited by the, the Pope Appointed, appointed mm. to become a cardinal. A cardinal. How, can you help? Can you help me understand how did that happen? And but he didn't consult me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he, uh, yes. So you actually just like you receive an email. No, 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 email, 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 like a parchment. No, 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 no parchment. So. <laughs> uh, in fact, I equally, you know, most of the time we don't even know that we are appointed until people tells us, you know. Oh. Oh. So in this case here, he made the announcement when he said the usual Sunday Angelus. In Rome, every Sunday, he will conduct the prayers in the Angelus prayer. And then after, he makes some announcements. Mm. And so... Oh, so it's not a once in a it's year. Not then casual. It's not casual. I mean, it's an official yeah. announcement. <laughs> official. Okay, but okay, he okay. doesn't tell you. So he will, after the prayers, he makes an announcement. And then the people SMS me saying, you appointed cardinal. 
I say, I do not know. I never receive anything from him. But can you say like, uh, la. Like, can you say, that's you too can. stressful for me? Yes, I mean, but then you have to have a good reason. Normally, mm. we don't say... But it's an uh, honour. It's, it's such a huge... But it's right. so stressful. It is. It, la, it it is. In a certain sense, a great honour to be appointed. <laughs> but uh, it's more a service to the church, a yeah. service to the Holy Father and service to the universal church. And because as cardinals, we are not just... Uh, Art intra, that means uh, just in charge of a particular diocese as yeah. in Singapore. So I also have to look outward and to see the needs of the whole universal church. So, so just to clarify, right? Like when you mentioned that these 128 cardinals are eligible to vote, they are also the ones that are the, the candidates to become the next pope as well. Yeah, I mean, technically, because and we can, yeah. one of us will have could to be. be you, la, so you know, it say. could be you. Could be, la, but. Um, oh I my don't, God, I don't, don't forget think, us. I don't think. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So who you think you're going to become the next pope? Usually I say stop right there, but today is a new day and a different day. So simply like, share, and subscribe and ring the notification bell. Bless mm. you. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Back to the episode. I do not know all the cardinals <laughs> yet. Yeah. First and foremost, <laughs> he he your favorites, uh, <laughs> first and foremost, we need to know the cardinals. So yeah. I do not know yeah, all so of them. How, how does that how are you how are you supposed to make a like a informed vote, right? If you mm. if you don't know them. That is why we have a conclave. Okay. When the Pope dies or when the Pope re- resigns. So we gather together, there will be discussion, there will be just press, reflection. Yeah, so it's not just voting. Actually, there's a series of uh, what we call um, discussion and so that we get to know the cardinals, uh, viewpoint. Just so we are, let me take a step back to explain the conclave, right? Mm. So some of your days, mm. a little bit older, might mm. have seen this on TV. So whenever mm. the Pope um, mm. passes on mm. or resigns, in yeah. the case of Pope uh, Benedict, Benedict XVI, um, basically the cardinals fly to the Vatican, right? Mm. And then they go into this some door. Some can sail. Uh, I mean, uh, some can. And then we, after, after the door closed, uh, nobody actually knows what happened. Never mm. met a guy that's invited to go in. Mm. Until now. Um, <laughs> and then something happened. And then basically, the world uh, and the people physically at the Vatican just stands there in vigil holding a candle and then they wait for smoke to come out. And then the yeah. smoke could be white smoke, black smoke. It's not magic. It's just like, you know, chemicals, right? To make the smoke, white smoke, black smoke. So if the smoke come out is black, means we have not decided. Everyone needs to vote unanimously in order for it to be elected. I'm, I have not voted before yet. Mm. Uh. Uh. So, interesting, eh? so really, the <laughs> those, those really no one knows yeah. like voter. <laughs> Normally, <laughs> all these are done in secret. Yeah. So even the cardinals have to take a vow of, ob- of secrecy before we start the whole process. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so yes, nothing yes. is communicated. Um, nothing is allowed to be communicated. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it's so crazy because like, I remember I was young, I was watching CNN, right? And CNN have one camera, right? Just specifically planted for the chimney. Yeah. And it's just mm-hmm. chimney watch for mm-hmm. like three days. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's Yeah, incredible. and, and the, for the longest time, I thought the white smoke, black smoke was like divine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'll be so stressed as a smoke white. person. Yeah, because my mom like, then near cry. And I'm, oh my God, the white. And I'm like, okay, hey, calm down, woman. <laughs> <laughs> so previously when you were Archbishop and now being mm-hmm. Cardinal, right? How different does your day, like day in a life look? Well, unless I go to Rome for meetings or for consultation or when we have consistory, consistory is the gathering of all the cardinals with the Holy Father to discuss on certain important uh, directions or changes that the Holy Father wants to make. Other than that, uh, here in in Singapore, mostly because I'm still the Archbishop of Singapore, mm. so my uh, time is basically the still... Um, managing the Archdiocese, which is my uh, primary responsibility. Of course, I also have to offer my service to the uh, Bishops' Conferences here. We belong to the Malaysian Singapore Brunei Bishops' Conference. That is one conference that is considered a regional conference, a local conference. Yeah. What, uh, what happens at these conferences? We have meetings, we About have discussion, what? topics. Like- 
Give issues. me an example of like a, 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 a major change. For example, how to social communication, we talk about family, how to promote family life. I see, I see. Then all these issues that affects the entire church in Asia. But of course, Asia, when we have meetings with the Asian Bishops Conference, it's a bit different because Asia is basically the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very diverse. Different um, countries have different struggles. And so this is where we meet together. Sometimes we try to come up with a common statement for in terms of uh, steering the direction of the church in Asia. Mm. Yeah, so these are the things that I do. And this present government is very consultative. Very often they will invite us for meetings, for consultations, especially on moral issues or issues that affect the lives of our people. Mm. And so we have many meetings with the government and also meetings with the uh, interreligious organizations as well because they, uh, they are important to maintain harmony mm. with us and mutual respect. Is it slightly weird when all the religious heads come together? Weird? Yeah. No, I think that's the best thing. No, I mean, it's really beautiful to look at mm. and it just feels like, oh, mm. it's really interesting mm. that Singapore did mm. this. All it, reli- no, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because mm. you're kind of... Because you are all men and women of faith, mm. they are really, really deep into the faith already, right? Mm. So then you all look around thinking that everyone else is worshipping not the right God. No. Do you ever have that thought? No, not at all. Especially for us Catholics, we don't subscribe to that because we believe that every religion has its values. Every religion at the end of the day, even for that matter, mm. a secular government, even the government is not against the faith mm. because at the end of the day, the government is working for the common good of the people. What does religion do? also promote the common good. Mm. So it is the interest, the common interest for people that unites both the secular and the religious. That is the reason why the government does not feel that religions are a threat. We are not a threat to government. In fact, we are here to be partners of the government. And the government sees us as partners because we are here to contribute. We are here to build up our Singaporeans together, living in a very harmonious uh, way and uh, be what we call uh, good citizens. Yeah. And so that is what we do. So all religions in their own ways are seeking for ultimate happiness. And so all of us have different experiences of God. Mm. It is sharing your faith. And then we are actually inspired by each other's faith. Actually, I'm very inspired uh, by the other religions. They are religious leaders, that kind of dedication, that kind of devotion. And sometimes you talk to them. What was what was inspiring and particularly surprising for you? Which which uh, religious leader in particular? I mean, it yeah. depends on which occasion. But they are the very... Recent ha- one, the recent one. Recent one. Yeah. Rec- was, yeah, we're going to keep pushing. Uh, yeah. The Joroestrianism. I was there. and so the, the religion? Yeah, yeah the Omar, religion. The yeah, so I went to visit them. So... You know, the, they, they have their priest. Mm. Uh, they're very, very nice. They are very, very humble and uh, very open, very receptive. So, in fact, all the religious leaders and the Muslims, oh, the Muslims also, I see all the Muslim religious leaders in Singapore here. They are really very nice people, uh, very um, uh, uh, respectful, and uh, you can see the humility in them, and you can see... Uh, their genuine uh, desire to promote goodwill. Yeah. yeah. So I have a bit of his childhood uh, background, right? Okay, and, like. Ooh. And so, based on what I read on the internet, like you grew up with a very devoted Catholic mom, and that was how like you started having influences or, or coming to know of God. And then eventually, when you were in primary school, he would used to go to a church to pray daily before wow. going to school. Every he day. prays during recess and then after school he go back to the church to pray again. Why? Now <laughs> you always knew <laughs> la, I guess. So right. now we know why he's cardinal. Yeah. <laughs> to a certain extent you always knew that this was That's so crazy. Eh? Last time go to school is like six AM eh? and before that he go to go to church to pray first. So why why do you have that? Uh? Like what 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 made you do it? Honestly, uh? I think uh, it's just like falling in love, huh? It's the grace of God. But in primary school, you fall in love with God. I wouldn't say that I fall in love with God, but uh, I know that something, someone is greater than me. I'm just drawn to it. And also, basically, I'm an introvert, you know. <laughs> I don't like to mix uh, 
around with too many people, you know. I'm not the type that you want to play games before school, uh, play all those. Oh. Uh, yeah, I don't like to uh, get myself all sweaty. <laughs> I don't like all these things. I you like to be, yeah. Pray, so, la. yeah. So, I'm a, If there was a library, you might have gone to a library, but there was a chapel, so you went to pray. Yeah, so... <laughs> anyway, I, I think also it is really the grace of God. I do not know why. I just went there and I found peace there. Right. I found uh, consolation there. So, then the Lord just drew me closer, closer to Him. Yeah. When did you know you wanted to become a priest? Because that was like... The first when? Time. Uh, when I was in sect two. Yeah, when I was in sector, I wanted to become a priest. But then I gave up the idea when I entered the army nah, because uh, you know, army for two and a half years, nah, there is no time to think about God, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so after that, I, I see army that time, I pray a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, then you pray, the, then you pray every single day. <laughs> so in the army, I said to myself, maybe. then after that, I, I joined the banking sector. Oh. And then uh, I was thinking, yeah. But then it was actually when I joined the banking sector that the thought came back again. Every time I go to church again and something on vocation, then I said to myself, "Am I running away from a vocation?" Right. So I, I, so ultimately again, what is happiness in life? You need to answer to your deepest call. So I said to myself, "If I'm always uh, what we call uh, unsettled when I hear such uh, vocation call, then let me give a chance. At least I can close that uh, horizon if I'm not called." then I can focus on what I want to do. Mm. So I said to myself, let me just focus on one thing at a time. And then, of course, uh, I got ordained even, yeah. Mm. How old were you when you got ordained? Oh, too young in uh. today's term, 27. Oh, wow. Ah, that's when I got married. I, uh, yeah, I joined a seminary at the age of 21. Of course, today... Did they tell you like, back then is William, lah, right? Mm. Go and date first, lah, you, you know? Yeah. In those you days, don't know no. yet. In those days, people were still very cool and gundo, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they just recruitment drive. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're like, okay, okay, we KPI. <laughs> but I had many girlfriends. I mean, oh! not 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 attached, but oh. I mean I have because young we were in the mixed community, yeah. so I was like a big brother to many of the younger girls who mm. come to me and uh, oh yeah. girlfriends as in yeah. female acquaintances yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but also according to online when you actually told your father that you wanted to go to seminary school he was not the most happy about it he was I mean my father was also Barclays, of course uh, you see you know we all inherit the same original sin you know so my father was also introvert he hardly speak. He was a disciplinarian. Ooh. And so, you know, I don't know whether he's happy or sad or so. You talk to him or so, you know, no reaction. <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> I suppose he must be happy in some, but at the same time, he doesn't, ex he's not expressive. So I would not know how uh. he felt. Anyway, I'm a bit curious because um, your seminary school was actually in Penang. So you had to move there. Well, what was that like? Like living alone for the first time and then... Oh like yes, having to make friends all sad. over again. Yeah, very sad. Mm. <laughs> in fact, when I was there, you know, in the seminary, the first uh, month, you know, I was thinking of leaving really, you know. Yeah, so the thoughts of leaving. And then the, the trouble is when I went there, you know, from the study, the first subject they taught us was philosophy. And we had to study two years <laughs> of philosophy before we study theology and script scripture. Because Catholic oh. theology is founded in philosophy. Because philosophy mm. is the way in which we communicate with the world. Mm. Because that's the only common language to communicate with the world is through philosophy. So, wow, oh, I'll talk about metaphysics, being and beings. Wow. Oh, <laughs> No, then all the all the big philosophers' names, you know, European and you know, ancient philosophy, Western philosophy. I tell you, uh, I was saying this is a bit too much. When I'm going to learn the word of God, I haven't studied theology yet. Oh, wow. You have to complete philosophy before you study scriptures and theology. So I was thinking, when I'm going to do the real thing? Uh? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we have to be founded in philosophy. So then, is it still like that today? Yeah, yeah, it's still oh, yeah, yeah, because that is the foundation for because we are Catholics, we need to transmit the faith in a logical, systematic manner to the world. Yeah, That's yeah. why philosophy is the foundation for theology. So we don't just study scripture and theology. Scripture and theology is good for those who already have faith, but if the faith is to communicate to people who are of not of our faith, we have to begin with where they are. That is philosophy about life, wow, about existence. Oh, it's so well thought. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Then from there, we can make progress to talk about God. 
So, the, so when I was there, wow, first month, I stay on it. They said, okay, pray, pray, pray. After that, second month. Uh, so I wrote down, I want to leave the seminary. I got a diary, you know, a journal. <laughs> and then after that, again, right. After I wrote like five, ten times already, I said, forget it, no need to write because every other day I was about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> then it just continued, yeah. So and also I was missing my Barclays uh, people, you know, my Ayo, friends in Barclays yeah. for the first year. Yeah, so it was a bit difficult. And then also when I went seminary, everybody was new to me. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. And then the, in the it was a regional seminary. <coughs> Malaysians, Sabahans, Sarawakians, they're all down there. It's a big community. When I was there, it's about 60 over. Us. Yeah, it's about 60 over people. So getting to know them is a bit difficult, and uh, yeah, but uh, I managed to survive. Mm. It'd be so funny, like you know how because you're a prominent like person, first cardinal of Singapore, then they want to get hold of your first diary, and then mm. when they put it in the museum, it's just <laughs> I want to leave, I want to leave. <laughs> I miss <So>, Barclays. <laughs> yeah, so I, I say that life is a journey, it's a process. So right, the the cast socks have different colour. Is there a significance to why this rank is this colour and like for example why cardinal is red colour? The castle is the white dress. Bishop is yeah. purple. Right? The dress. Yeah. Yeah. Bishop is purple. Then yeah. the Pope is white. Yeah. White cassock, uh, yeah, I mean cassock is a symbol of purity, the white cassock. So if, like for mass, when we are celebrating liturgy, we always wear white regardless of who you are. We have to right. wear because it is a celebration, the sacraments or the Eucharist. Then, different cassocks, uh, that are being worn. Cassock means normally when you talk about cassock, it's the daily use, for daily oh. use. That means outside the liturgy. A priest, uh, for cassock, it, could, it depends. If they depends on the religious orders, then they use different colours. But white is a normal uh, colour. Then for bishops, of course, bishops, uh, we wear the, what we call yeah purple in the sense that, you know, purple is the symbol of uh, being uh, humiliated. Jesus, when he was he was wearing a yeah. purple garment, you know, when he was being mocked at. So a bishop is supposed to suffer for the church. Ooh, which is why Lent every day. That's uh, that why we wear we, the, the, the head scarf because Juketo is all purple because a bishop is reminded that if you have come bishop, you have to suffer for the church. Whereas cardinal wear scarlet because we are called not only to suffer for the church, but be ready to die for the church. Oh, oh that's right. So the scarlet is the GD. symbol of wow, blood. So, serious, uh, <laughs> so because uh, that is why in cardinals they are called princes of the church. In that sense, they are called princes of church because we must be ready to die for the kingdom of God. That's why you are cardinal. Wow. So, uh, so different colors symbolizes different responsibilities, and uh, yeah, and sacrifice. When you're doing your uh, performance review, like you go through, what's some of my new yes, yeah. responsibilities? Are you ready to die for the church? <laughs> I have I have a question regarding the scalp cap. Yes. The, does, is there adhesive inside? How does it how does it stay on oh, the head? Uh? Got hair. Oh. If you got hair, it's not possible, right? You mm. must be bald, right? Uh, most of the time, by the time you become a bishop, you'll be quite bald. <laughs> 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 it's a prerequisite. No, but how is it very high friction inside, or is it a little bit sticky or oh, velcro? There, there's or a, there's a, uh, the other side of the cloth, there's a certain friction. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. Mm. I was asking Father oh. Terrence, he's like, I don't know, I got us. Yeah, mm. not yet. <laughs> uh, but of course, by the time you become bishop, mostly you are quite bald, so it just fits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the juketto is a symbol of the anointed one. Oh, what's that now? Anointed one. The juketto is a. Juketto, the skull cap. Oh, oh, the yeah, the skull cap oh, okay. is the. Symbol of being the anointed one. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's why the bishops, only bishops wear that skull cap. Right. Then when you take out, you get stuck to your hair. No, they, they, the cloth is a bit rough on oh. the other side. Yeah. So it, yeah. it can hold. But of course, if, if you've got wired hair, then it cannot. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like you cannot be a high flyer in a bishop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You gotta start holding it. Uh, no. You cannot perm your hair. <laughs> if you have any hair left. <laughs> Mm. I see. Taking the path of priesthood and then knowing that you have to take a, a vow of celibacy, right? Was was that a difficult decision for you? Because we are only human, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, thank you for yeah. meeting. I really yeah. that. That's a great. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a choice. I mean, honestly, I love to get married. Mm. Mm. I think family life is a beautiful life. And to have someone uh, to love and the family to be close together. It's beautiful. And I think uh, marriage is really a beautiful gift of God. If you have found someone, uh, yeah. and I hope those who are married 
will cherish that because uh, you know that marriage life is also not so simple. Huh? We have a lot of uh, difficulties and they realize they cannot get together. So, you know, Jesus bless you. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one week in, a, well, a, uh, one week in the uh, marriage can have blessing from That's why they say, uh, from engagement oh, to you. wedding ring to suffering. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I, I, I love to get married. Uh, But again, I said to myself honestly, you know, I love to, I love to have friends. And although I'm introvert, I like, I like, I like to have sincere friends. Yeah, yeah. close circles. But then I said to myself, and I know that even when I love someone, you know, your love, no matter how much the person loves me, I cannot complete me. That's my point. Uh, you cannot complete me. I feel that I got a reservoir of love uh, to love more than one person. I want to give my love to all of humanity. So for me, just to love one person is uh, it's like uh, mm. the tank is not used up. Right. So it's only when I reach out to people, when I serve others, when I help others, I find life is such a great joy. Uh, life is really uh, fulfilling and um, that is what makes me happy as a priest. Okay, okay. I always like, when I attend mass and then I, I, I listen to the priest preach and all that stuff, right? And because I'm in this, <laughs> this industry, right, of knowing the right things to say and then because we're in marketing, so we're also, every day we're interpreting things, like right? trying to make sense and give meaning to brands. Mm. I always feel like, the profession of a priest does interest me. Huh. But the vow of celibacy is where I draw the line. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But yeah. I, I think I need to correct that false uh. Uh, or very narrow understanding of celibacy. Mm. I think celibacy is not a question of not having sex. It's more than that. Celibacy But enough already that is one. Inclusive <laughs> love. Celibacy, actually, at the end of the day, celibacy is to help a priest to love inclusively. Mm. And what we need is not sex. Don't tell me you get married every day, you must have sex. No. Uh, so. <laughs> Wrong, Dad. Yeah, no. Stop. Uh, no. <laughs> you exactly. Keep it under wraps. So, exactly. precisely, I mean, actually, for me as a pastor, common, when I talk to people, those are married, Some have sex only once a blue moon. <laughs> once true. a leap year. True, true. true. Yeah. So, it's not a, year. so it's not the physical <laughs> no, sex. Not. Physical years. sex is meaningful when it's an expression of love. Yeah. Right. So what we need is love, not sex. So sex becomes an expression of love for the person because we are yeah, human yeah. beings. We need to touch. We need to be touched. We need to feel. But other than that, actually, when you are loving, that is enough to So for me, uh, for you, what makes me happy is that uh, I have people who, whom I love and they also love me. And that is the greatest joy in life. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No, get, get yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no, no. I can get behind that. It's just <laughs> like, that I'm not going to get in front of that. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about like, so evolution, right? And like, updating and, and, and things like that. Like, A lot of people don't know this, but there was a second Vatican Council that actually made a huge amount of changes to the church that we see today. So like before, I, I believe it happened in the 1960s. Uh, before this, Mass was always in Latin. The priests back faced the congregation um, and there was quite a lot of like different aspects to it. And then that changed. So now like Mass is in English or any other language, like even Chinese, vernacular, Chinese language. Language, vernacular languages, the, the priest faces uh, the, the congregation. Do you feel like there will be a time where the um, church will need an updating again, especially because today it's way more secularized than it's ever been? We are updating in terms of pastoral approach. As, I told, as I've said before, doctrines cannot change. Truth cannot change. Mm. I, I give you a very concrete example today. Actually, life has changed very much huh? um, compared to, let's say, 60 years ago. In those days, uh, people... Uh, they get married at what age? 16 years old. How long do those people live? 55. Yeah. 60 is considered very old. You know, My father died at the age of 59. So in those days, if you die at 60, it's considered okay. Mm. Now people are living until 80 over years old. So the whole approach has changed. And people are getting married at the age of 35. On the average, 30, 35. Those days, you get married at the age of 16. 16, uh, and... Uh, maturity in terms of maturity you you become mature 
uh, at the age of 14, 15. Mm. Okay? Then, of course, by 16, you get married. So there is no problem with chastity. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's no problem. You don't have to control your sexual drive because that's a time when your sexual drive is very strong. So true. Uh, yeah. So now you got to wait for <laughs> 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> so now you got to wait for 15 years, 20 yeah. years. So you are 15. You've been married 30, then, 20 years. Yeah. By then tired already. Yeah. 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 So there's a situation has changed. In those days, uh, if you have a problem with your husband. Not a big issue because uh, you got married at 16 and then you have, let's say, you have different your husband. By the time 50, your husband have been dead, you can continue your life. There's no need to have a divorce <laughs> because it's only about 20, 30 years you can tolerate. Yeah, yeah. Now, 80 years old, 85, you cannot take it. So, situation has changed. <laughs> so I'm wondering when will he die? Yeah. So, that's why I say it's the whole cultural, social change that has resulted in the situation we have today. So the church is therefore saying, in the light of all these developments, how do we minister? Do, do you feel like the Catholic Church has um, difficulties communicating, evangelizing, and, and really just re-welcoming back the youth? Yes, mm. indeed. The trouble is also many of our priests, by the time, you know, when they enter the seminary age of 30, by the time they are ordained, they are almost 35, 40 or so. Mm. Uh, but the time when they are ordained, they become old already. Mm. They cannot connect with those who the younger ones in their twenties. Ah. So I think we have an issue. Uh, but again, you know, age doesn't ma doesn't mean that you cannot communicate to the yeah. young people. Is whether you are with them, whether you mix with them often. If you journey with them, then you understand their struggles. So it's not a question of age. Age does not divide us. It's whether we are companions with them. So, but you see, priests, as they get older, they tend to journey with those who are adults and married people. Mm. So the young people tend to have uh, fewer priests journeying with them. Right. So, so that is our difficulty. But I, I, I suppose today we have many also uh, lay people who are committed to the church as volunteers or as full-time workers. Uh, so I think that will kind of help us to close the gap uh, in terms of communication. So like in my office, we got the Arch Communication Office, digital media and so on. They help us to communicate not just with the larger population, but also with the young people. Yeah, I, I see you're quite um, active on social media. It's mm. like your Instagram mm. account, yeah. and Kadi, mm. Kadiji. Mm. Mm. Kadiji? Kadiji. <laughs> Kadiji is his Instagram? No way. He's not. Uh, no, no, no. Why you make that up? No, but there was... <laughs> Kadi Will. I'm so impressed. As in, Kadi oh, Will. Sorry, Kadi Will. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But Kadi G was. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Kadi G, right? Because like, William Go, right? So, uh. Kadi G. Because Kadi B. You know Kadi B? Don't know. No, no. <laughs> later, I send Bianca. Some but in your experience, right, do you think that the challenges that the youths are facing or like what they are concerned about has changed a lot over like maybe the past decade? Of course. I mean, different epoch, different uh, periods, we have different struggles. Our struggles and your struggles are different. That's why no one ever tell your children when they grow up, you yeah. know, when I was your age, uh, yeah. They say you're outdated. Nah. They don't say. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst way to start. Yeah, uh, yeah. they don't start a conversation because yeah, yeah. every uh, period of time is unique. Yeah. I think uh, hopelessness and despair seems to be the current trend among young people mm. because, first and foremost, they have to compete with others and the competition is very tough. Survival of the fittest. Then, on top of that, they do not have the holistic love of a family of brothers and sisters to journey with them. Parents are hardly in. Parents are always out. And then they are looking for true friendship. And, you know, today friendship tends to be very superficial over social media and all this. This is a, also sometimes reflect the, in, the lack of capacity to forge personal relationship. Media, it can be used. It's very impersonal. And you can even bluff people. And right. people, young people today, uh, they are more more young people committing suicide. In those days, it's unthinkable. Mm. Unthinkable for a young person to commit suicide. Nowadays, because of competition or uh, relationship, relationship yeah. issues. So I feel with them, so that's why I say, you have to ask our young people, what are they living for? If you're living for yourself, for holidays, I tell you, you are being short-sighted because after, once you attain what you have, if you can attain it all, you will find it is empty. If you cannot attain it, 
you get angry and you destroy yourself. But when you live with a higher, you're driven by a higher motive, which is actually love of humanity. Mm. So that is what is driving me in life because I don't just live for this world. And I do my best trying to help people and do all I can. So my life is, uh, at the end of the day, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, you know, have you lived your life in vain? It reminds me of one of my favorite like sermon illustrations ever. Mm. So it was like this uh, pastor, he was in like an auditorium. I'm not sure whether I've shared this before, but then, anyway, he, he was holding like a, a, a rope. Then after that, there's like a short part that is like maybe the size of his thumb that it was red, painted red. And then he said, okay, so then now like you follow this rope and then you look around the room. So then it's an auditorium. Mm. So then they look around and there's like a rope that is like pasted on the wall. One, so it's around all that. Then he said like, this here is your life. Eh. This is your life on this earth. Eh. Right. And then this is like- Your eternity. Your, yeah, your eternity. And right. then, but then people are so short-sighted. And to, obsessed over and, this part. And obsessed over this. Then- that really like no you see blew my mind this is a very Christian church thing <laughs> illustrations yeah like <laughs> really taking out props and <laughs> yeah no, no, but at some point I think in, in the, uh, like I <laughs> the Catholic I, I suddenly <laughs> realised oh my god am I complaining <laughs> the, yeah, I, saw, I saw the hesitation yeah the, the, sometimes the priest take out powerpoint which is not bad <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> which is not bad. Which is not bad. Calibri. Mm. Yeah. As Catholics, we, we, we don't push the faith, right? Yeah. We don't force anyone to mm. join. And I think um, just last week, so I got married. I'm going to mention that as many times mm. as possible. Okay, I'm Catholic, so I got married at uh, the cathedral. Mm. And what I didn't realize, because 90% of like my guests were actually non Catholics, were that many of them were actually afraid to mm. come to church because mm. many of them had the impression that mm. once they step in, they're going to be asked, mm. hey, do you want to join a church? Do you want to do this mm. and that? Mm. And so actually some of them were genuinely afraid and I didn't know only after the fact they actually came up to me and went, that mm. was actually really beautiful. And I'm so mm. glad that mm. um, Father Terence, who was the, the celebrant who has been on this show, also took time to just explain every single step mm. and mm. also said, if you're not Catholic, just just pray in your own way. Just mm, mm, pray yourself mm, and it's okay. We just welcome everyone and they actually felt like, wow, they, mm, it changed their impression mm, yeah. of, of Catholicism for them. But um, I think in general, I must say, Singapore is a very exceptional situation. Okay. In Singapore, all our religious leaders are moderate right. in their approach and uh, they are, in that sense, uh, receptive and you won't find that... Uh, our religious leaders are what do you call very pushy or coercive. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's a good thing. We are actually in Singapore, we are very blessed with moderate religious leaders. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have the that kind of extremism as you see in other countries. Yeah. You you mentioned before as well, like you 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 welcome mm. the fact that this government is so welcoming in consulting yeah. Yeah. Um, both you as well as the yeah. other religious leaders. Was there any prominent example of like a, a policy that you felt very proud of to have consulted on? Most of the consultations uh, they are confidential. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's better for me not to mention them because uh, at the end of the day, we must understand the government is elected by the people. Mm. The government's task is to ensure law and order. Mm. Our task is to help the government to govern wisely. And so we are consulted. We give them our opinions on all the issues that are affecting the country. And so we give our viewpoints. Like the, I mean, if you want to give one clear example, it's LGBTQ because it affects mm. everybody. But the government doesn't only consult the religion. Also, they themselves also consult those people in LGBTQ as well. Yeah. So it has to be an inclusive policy. Yeah. And th I think this is why I think it's very important because it involves the, the happiness of the people so that at least we can come to a win-win situation mm -hmm. and to be able to try to include everyone in yeah. their position that without... Uh, or, or at yeah. the very least understand yeah. what the trade yeah. for your position. Yeah. So, so if say one day the Singapore government says we are going to allow same-sex marriages, mm. how would the church respond to that? We would just, I mean, at the end, we just have to express opinion, period. Mm. At the end of the day, we will have to abide by the government's decision because they are the elected yeah. representatives. Mm. Mm. Cardinal, can you uh, help me understand why is the church um, against mm. same-sex marriage? Firstly, you must understand that uh, the church... Uh, believes in the word of God. It means the mm. Bible. Okay? 
the Word of God, we believe, is the revelation uh, from God of how we should live our life. So, uh, the scriptures are clear that uh, marriage is between the man and the woman. Mm. So, coming from that position, the church therefore cannot accept same-sex marriage. And I think this is where also some people do not quite understand. Uh, they want the bishop to say same-sex marriage is okay. Even if I were to say same-sex marriage is okay, it's all right. If I were to say something that is against the Bible and you think, oh, what bishop say is right, I think mm. I'll be deceiving you and you're deceiving yourself because you know that what I'm saying is against the Holy Scriptures. Mm. So if you are a faith believer, then of course uh, you cannot accept. So this becomes very, you can say, uh, debatable. So that's why LGBTQ, you, can find, you cannot find a common agreement if you ask doctors, you know, whatever it is, or sociologists, mm. they cannot come to an agreement. I mean, we empathize. Yeah. I mean, we accept LGBTQ as they are. And we don't try to change them. But uh, for me, it's very clear. If that is what the Bible is telling us, we try to live up our faith. And so for people who are Catholics and so on, you know, if they're LGBTQ, what do I do with them? Yeah. I, don't I don't change them. In fact, actually, I have many friends who are LGBTQ. Uh, they have no issue with me. They know where my stand is because yeah. I always tell people, hello, I'm a servant of God, you know. I'm a servant of the church. I'm not the master. If you are a minister in the government today, can you say your own views? Yeah, so I don't no, think yeah. I disagree with the prime minister. Yeah. Oh, that, that'll be the, and then you better go. Then you should not be in the cabinet. Mm. So here I'm a servant of the church and therefore I can only teach what the church teaches and what the scripture teach. Yeah. I cannot teach otherwise. So when people who are LGBTQ, what do I do? As I said, I don't impose church doctrines on them. I don't impose the rules on them. We don't try to convert people from one, uh, what we call, sexual orientation to another, but I will bring them to Jesus and I will tell the person, let Jesus tell you what to do. Mm. Period. Finish. So they are still very much welcomed in the church? Of course, everybody mm. is welcome. The church is always inclusive. No one is excluded. And this LGBTQ, they just come. But then, of course, we have certain church doctrines and regulations um, mm. because you cannot, church, right? yeah. cannot receive communion, all those things. Yeah, but this is the reality. Because I want to say I learned a lot of big words when I converted. So, what is important <laughs> now? So, for, uh, what is important, I think yeah, we have to make a distinction between the law of gradualness and the gradualness of the law. Gradualness of the law simply means that the law evolves. That means truth evolves. We do not accept. Truth is truth. There is no today truth, tomorrow not truth. That is what today moral relativism is all about. Today you say, okay, today uh, LGBT, okay. I don't know, 100 years time, not okay. I mean, we don't, truth is truth. There is no such thing as truth becomes falsehood and falsehood becomes truth. So, so like when I was growing up, for example, I, I, I mm. learned that if you commit suicide, it was like you, you, you go to hell because it was a, a yeah, because, mortal sin. So yeah. if, if someone commits suicide because of mental health issues, yeah. is that still like the, the belief? Is that still an equal sin? No, no, no. So okay, we okay. leave it to the so mercy of God. Yeah, understood. We think God will be more yeah. merciful. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Because for a sin to be a sin, there must be full knowledge full consent. Understood, understood. So if there is no full knowledge or no full consent, then it's a bit different. Even for the question of LGBTQ, okay? There are some people who have chosen that way of life. Now the question is, is it uh, uh, an invincible erroneous conscience or is it vincible? Invincible means to say the person has actually he has studied, he has read as much as he could lah, huh? mm. to, ask, to ask himself, if he's a faith believer, to ask, is it really LGBTQ? Is it really against God, against the church? He read this, read that. He said, no, I think it's okay. He's okay. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because it's invincible, erroneous conscience. Conscience is erroneous according to the understanding of the church because it's against our faith. Mm. But the person has tried his best to understand the faith, try to read, broadly and say that I think it is not the sin. So that is a question of invincible erroneous conscience. Oh, then of course there's a difference if a person for example just wake up from his sleep, I think uh, 
all this uh, LGBTQ, uh, that is the right way. He has not, never done any real study. He has never done the research to see what is the truth. Oh, wow. Uh, so there is a difference in the okay. church. There. Invincible does not mean to say it's the right thing. Oh, no, it's of erroneous. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is so erroneous. in this case, here's what I'm trying to say is even among Catholics LGBTQ, there are many who really believe that this is the right thing to do. I really believe that God has blessed me. Okay. I mean, I'm not endorsing it. But if you believe it, you have a right to follow your conscience because and the church teaching is you must always follow your conscience. Um, and of course, uh, to follow your conscience means that it must be an informed conscience. Yeah, yeah. Not just a conscience uh, based on your own subjective views. Yeah. It's just my own no, I, I hope this doesn't feel like a, like a homily, like a giant homily. Because what, <laughs> yeah. what I see, right? And what I admire about you is the utmost faith, the utmost conviction yeah. in. And, and that's, that's the same thing of what turns people off, right? It's the same thing that what turns young people off, especially because people that have needs that are seemingly a little bit more pressing, law, like my, my son got to eat and I'm not making enough money. That, that one takes precedence over anything the Bible could tell me because that's, you know, that's important to me now. And, and the inability to have faith and conviction on one, not, not necessarily a religion or, or any religion, is that you, you jump. You know, you, you, you believe this could be right, you believe this could be right, you believe this could be right. You have no idea whether you are walking the correct route. And so you completely just keep doubting yeah. second guessing yourself then you go into a place you feel very lost in life where many of us feel really lost in life you won't feel lost when life is difficult you feel lost when you are not sure whether it's needlessly difficult you know like in a game where, where certain chapters are difficult you know you're going on the right path <laughs> mm. you don't feel lost in that game you just feel like the game is difficult as it should be yeah but you feel lost when you're just wandering around then there's no quest then the quest is very small and then you're not sure you know, and where I see for you and where I admire about the, the life you live is that you are very sure. Mm. Yeah. And most of us might never reach that level of sureness. I'm curious, right? Because like in Christian churches, there could be like healing services, this kind of stuff. And you see people like really, they got, got a tumor. Then after the, I mean, the ultrasound clearly shows it. Lah. Then after they go back, no tumor. Then the doctor's like, what? Then, so I'm wondering like, do such things happen in Catholic churches? And like, or maybe what is like, the closest thing to a miracle you think you have ever seen? Many miracles. Uh, all kinds of miracles, uh, testimonies that people will come to tell you. I mean, I don't go and investigate, but uh, <laughs> people will come and tell you, oh, you, that day you prayed for me, you know, I was healed. Or you talk about the babies who are supposedly uh, abnormal, should not be... Uh, should not give birth to them. Uh, many doctors advise against uh, such women. And those who have faith continue. And uh, um, how put it? Uh, then the baby came out normal. One very recent one, when this lady came to me and the doctor really said, you know, this child will not be normal. You know, you should abort. But the lady has deep faith. And we prayed and I prayed for her. And uh, the best was, when the child was born, uh, the child was completely numb. Mm. Again, even just before she was giving birth, again, the doctor said it would be, the child might not live for very long. Mm. And so it still happened. And then she was amazed that the, then they sent quickly for DNA, for the, what, for the test for the, the child was completely numb. And I believe miracles can happen. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I have many testimonies of people who come in to tell me to say that uh, uh, in spite of all the doctor's confirmation and so on, uh, was healed. Yeah. Yeah. Last time when I was an altar boy, right? Then the, the, like the miracle story, right? They always come around, right? It's because last time we always cook uh, the communion bread. Yeah. But not, I don't bless it. <laughs> so it's just bread. But also stealing from the church, like, you know. I also take. Yeah. So then <laughs> you will just take some food in your pocket, then we just snack on it, right? And then and so it's tasteless anyway. It's tasteless, yeah. But it's just no, but it's so short. <laughs> it's the forbidden, mm. you know? Um and then so the 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 people around the, the church, right, or the, the stories spread from generations of altar boys down, right? Is that there are people that go and tap out uh blessed ones. Means yeah. they, it represents the body of, consecrated, of Christ. Yeah, consecrated, correct. Um 
And then when they reach home, right, in the Tupperware or in the bag, right, it, it's like flesh and blood. Yeah, so, so we were talking about the miracle of uh, Lanciano where, where as it's on the altar, right, it transforms into... Oh, and then, dang! And then the blood, right, they, they were tested and it's like, it's, it's Jesus' blood type. How do you know everything. it's Jesus' blood type? It's do you know that Jesus is INFP? Right? <laughs> <laughs> According to MBTI, they will show like, who else also have your personality, right? Jesus, Jesus. Under, yeah, under sick. INFP. Sick, sick, sick. <laughs> how dare they monetize it? <laughs> I don't know how they know no, but it, yeah, it's, it's crazy to hear of these miracles. I mean, like, I, I didn't realize about the tapa one. Lah. That's insane. You suddenly come home and then like, <laughs> oh my God, why is there like body? It, I mean, it could be I'll a be so passed scared. down story to make yeah, sure yeah. Boys don't so still scared. consecrated hosts. No, no, but, but the miracle of, of, of Lanciano, like, uh, we're speaking with his eminence, like, it happens every year. But again, as I've said, <laughs> I, I don't like to talk too much about miracles because at the end of the day, miracles are sensational things. It yeah. helps, but uh, it's just like getting married. You know, it's not the wedding day. It's a big... Mm. Big wedding day, you know, big grand wedding. It makes a beautiful wedding. It's actually the day to day living, it's a relationship. So, what makes us happy in life is the day to day relationship. It's true. Yeah. It's true. No, because every time, okay, like obviously I've, I'm not the best mm. Catholic, right? Mm. But every time I find myself losing my faith, right? It's the miracles that made me go, but it must be real though. Yeah, the, religion, no, the like, miracle of exorcism of my mother. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I cannot deny this. I cannot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. And apparently, it's true. Is it true that if you perform two miracles, you get to be a saint? Something along those what? lines. What? I mean, first and foremost, you might live a holy life, lah. Yo, for sure. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, absolutely. At the end of the day, we are we are not the healers. It is God who make use of us. We are not the healers. I will I won't claim that I'm the healer, but I will avail myself to God yeah. to heal through me. Yes. Yeah. But then if you talk about a creation of, of a saint, of a saint, of course, uh, after his death, of course, the first thing is make sure the person has lived a holy life. Yes. Then after that, we need uh, two miracles to confirm that he is really, so to speak, in heaven already. So the yeah. most prominent example for me, I think it was a recent one was, was Padre Pio, where like the first miracle was that Stigmata appeared on his body, so it was like all the the, um, the wounds of Christ, like um, before crucifixion, and then after that was after he passed. Wait, away. is it permanent? No, I, I can't remember. It okay. was permanent. But then the second miracle was that when he passed away, and then they buried him, his body was completely uh, uncorrupted, like it didn't right. rot. I mean, they, when there, there are a number of it. this kind of saints that the body didn't rot. Yeah, but it's like as a man of faith, yes, science also has an answer to that. Of course, yeah, but yeah. Mm. Interesting happens. Anyway. Okay, so thank you very much for watching today's episode and thank you very much His Eminence for joining us and sharing with us so honestly. And like, share and subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Also, if you're wondering why we don't have other religious leaders, we try to reach out we to try them. Very but, hard, but, right? yeah, we, we really are trying. Actually, We've we don't have trying. a lot of religious leaders but what's the, what's the equivalent? What do you mean? Of, uh, of a cardinal in the other religion oh. groups that are in Singapore. Yeah, let us know. Also, if you know like system, a, know. a yeah. Hindu priest <laughs> We've been who trying can, to get one, yeah, really. can communicate to us in English and break down their scriptures, help us. Comment down below. Thank you. Thanks okay. for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I was hoping you wear the the castle. <laughs> <laughs> can or not? Can or right? Is it, uh, is it blessed for me? Can. Can, can or right? I wasted. But sure. we used the informer so we just... Ah, oh, shit. Mm. Also, if we say formal, you will come in the castle. Mm-hmm. You see, informal because you want to connect with the young. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm.